16 tall ships arrived amongst a formidable escort of pleasure craft. Helicopters, airplanes, blimps, and even balloons passed overhead as the host ship of Operation Sail, the United States Coast Guard Eagle, began the promenade. The tall ships, graceful and dignified, sailed proudly down the harbor as their sons and daughters, the warships, stood respectfully still. At the entrance to the harbor aboard the Forrestal, the president, vice president, and a good majority of the cabinet and many members of the diplomatic corps as well as politicians reviewed the fleet. The Eagle, with its 22,000 feet of sail and 20 miles of rigging. Its 22 sails give it a top speed of 16 knots. The Eagle is a training ship with a three-masted bark. It has square sails on the two forward masts and fore and aft sails on the aftermast. It was built as the Horst Wessel in Hamburg, Germany in 1936, and it came to the Coast Guard as a war reparation. It was built long after the days of the square riggers. Most of these ships had been on their way to New York since May 2nd when they left Plymouth, England, stopping at Tenerife in the Canary Islands and Bermuda. From Bermuda, they were scheduled to race to Newport, Rhode Island. However, the race was canceled after it got underway due to bad weather. They approached New York either by Long Island Sound or along the South Shore, stopping in various ports on the island in Connecticut and New Jersey before arriving in New York Harbor on Saturday. Following the Eagle was the Denmark from Denmark. It was built in Denmark in the 1930s. To prevent German seizure at the outbreak of World War II, Denmark sent her to the United States, where she was used as a training ship and then returned in 1945. A mere 205 feet long, the Christian Radich of Norway is one of the smallest of the tall ships. Although she is about 50 feet shorter than the Denmark, she has a similar old-fashioned appearance. Argentina's Libertad is a recent addition to the training ship fleet, 1960, and has a low funnel near her stern. Libertad is one of the fastest of the tall ships. In 1966, she crossed the Atlantic in eight days. The Chilean Navy's Esmeralda is a four-masted barkentine. She has square sails on the foremast, fore and aft sails alone on the other three masts, and was launched in 1954. The Esmeralda has been the cause of controversy as protesters have charged that the Chilean government tortured political prisoners on board the ship. Operation Sail is an outgrowth of Op Sail in 64, held in New York City to celebrate the World's Fair. The event attracted 24 ships and appears to have been forgotten the minute it was over. The Gloria is the youngest of the tall ships. It was built for Columbia in 1968. She is easily recognized by her steamship-like bridge near the stern. West Germany's 285-foot bark, the Gorch Folk, resembles the Coast Guard's Eagle, although she was built nearly 20 years later, in 1958. Her 23 sails are handled by 100 cadets who range from 18 to 24 years of age. The ungainly Nippon Maru of Japan somewhat resembles a motor ship with sails. She was, in fact, rigged down by the Japanese during World War II and used as a freighter. Nippon Maru can often be seen sailing into San Francisco Bay. Poland's 291-foot full-rigged ship, Dar Pomenza, was built in Germany in 1909, but was turned over to France after World War I. She remained with France until 1929, when the people of Poland turned her over to the Poland Nautical College. The Segres of Portugal has red crosses of Christ on her sails and carries a crew of 203. She was in German and Brazilian hands before being bought by Portugal in 1961. Although very similar to the Esmeralda, Spain's Juan Sebastian del El Cano was built 27 years earlier. The 370-foot topsail schooner 
is one of the few training ships to have sailed all the way around the world. She is also the only tall ship to carry guns. Romania's Mercia is a 269-foot bark. Her prominent figurehead is a bust of Prince Mercia of Romania, a 14th-century military hero. The Soviet Union's Kruzhenstern is the tallest of the tall ships. It is 378 foot long and has a four-masted bark. She was built in 1926 as a flying ship for a Chilean firm. She was sailed until 1939 as a Cape Horner, far into the steamship age. After the tall ships passed, hundreds of other sailing ships made their way up the Hudson, like the Sir Winston Churchill, which we visited in Hempstead Harbor on Friday. The Churchill, like most of the other ships, is a training vessel. It is not technically a ship of the British Navy, but is owned by the British public, who paid for her through contributions. It is crewed by young people from all over the world, and for Operation Sail, the young people were all girls. The ship's captain, however, is a Royal Navy man, Patrick Collis. How did you crew this ship for this sail? Well, we crewed it from girls from all over the British Isles and also from other countries as well, as far away as New Zealand. How are they to captain? How they what? How are they to captain? You're the captain. Uh, how are they as sailors? Oh, well, they're not professional sailors. They're both schoolgirls, um, typists, secretaries, one's a housewife. Um, but I'm the captain, and they all realize that, and they all know that, and uh, I do my job as captain, and they do theirs as crew, and it works out very well. I thought women were supposed to be bad luck on board ships. No, 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 no. One woman is. But there's always <laughs> safety in numbers. And tomorrow you'll be sailing an Operation Sail. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, we're going down, leaving here tomorrow, and we're sailing down to um, Hell's Gate to Gravesend Bay, where we shall anchor on the night of the 3rd, and then on the morning of the 4th we all form up, and sail into New York, of course, where we have a review by the President, of course. One final thing. Could you describe the ship for us? Tell us about it, how it handles and how it works, and just a well, general description. It's a 300 ton, three masted topsail schooner. Uh, that means the masts are 115 feet high. Uh, she has a draft of 16 feet. Uh, she's 153 feet long and a 25 foot beam. And uh, maximum speed under sail is 14 knots. Uh, she's on the lines of a Baltic schooner with sort of yacht innovations in the hull to make the hull a little faster. And of course, we don't carry cargo, you see. We're always what's technically known as in ballast. And uh, she's a very handy ship. Um, in fact, coming across the, the Atlantic from Bermuda, uh, I was sailing very light winds, unfortunately, but the ship likes wind. Uh, but we had light winds, and we were doing about four to four and a half knots. And, you know, with a ship like mine, if you balance her properly, like most sailing ships, you don't need a helmsman. And she was steering herself for about five hours with nobody on the wheel at all. And she's going straight as a die. She's a perfect lady, in other words. The Sir Winston Churchill drew a lot of attention during Operation Sail, although it was far from a tall ship. The big attraction was the all-girl crew. Alison Deary, and I come from North Hertfordshire, which is just north of London. Have you ever been on a sailing boat before the Winston Churchill? Only small sailing dinghies. I've never been anything bigger than a 14-foot dinghy before now. What was it like? What, the Winston Churchill? It's very different. It's uh, everything's in, in the sheets, the, the sails work the same, but everything's got so much, so harder, you know, and there's e extra lines that you don't get in a dinghy, but... Well, did somebody tell you what to do, or did you know what oh, to yeah. do? Yeah, no, we get told what to do. We're divided up into three watches, and each watch has a leader. Who, t who She basically just tells you what to do. You know, all you have to do is tug lines. Have you ever been to New York before? No, I've never been to the States before now. And you, your New York Harbor tomorrow will be your first time there? Yeah, that's right. You're looking forward to it, I assume. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> All the girls seem there. so shy and, and a little reticent about uh, talking to people. It, why is that? Well, we've sort of had it ever since we started the trip, and we're sort of in our third week now, so... You mean people poking cameras in your face and asking right, you silly questions yeah. like me, right? What are you going to do after Operation Sail? Are you going back on the, the Sir Winston? No, um, we leave it at Boston, and a crew of boys come out to sail it back across the Atlantic. We fly home. 
Now, when men are on a ship, they call it she. What do you girls call it, him? Oh, no, we call it she as well. <laughs> we'll return for another look at Operation Sail, but first, Dr. Myron Luke tells us about naval action during the Revolutionary War. Dr. Luke, what role did the tall ships play in the Revolutionary War? Well, John, I think that the Revolutionary period obviously was the era of tall ships. And wherever you had clashes between first-class Navy, such as the French Navy and the British Navy, they were between what we would call the, the tall ships. Um, the, um, I would think that most of the vessels which crossed and crisscrossed the Atlantic Ocean were not necessarily um, ships with a great deal of sail on them. Um, you're always surprised at the number of ships that made the transatlantic crossing that were that were very small but uh, when they transported troops or when great flotillas of, of men of war went out this was the day of tall ships uh, the the tall sails there's no doubt about it but the revolutionary war was basically fought on the land wasn't it we there were no major yeah. engagements Actually, we didn't have what one would term, in all accuracy, an American Navy. We had ships that went out to fight, and certainly they were entitled to the Navy at, at the day, but it, it's not the kind of a Navy that you and I would think of. England had a Navy, France had a Navy, Spain had a Navy, and so on, and so did Holland. But... Uh, we didn't have it to, to that extent. We had, however, some some tremendous seamen, and I suppose there's not a school child anywhere who has not known or heard of John Paul Jones, uh, one of our tremendous men in all of our history. And uh, he did what I would think today would be uh, the he would have been maybe the admiral of our navy if we if we had such a thing, but but we didn't. It was not the kind of warfare that we were geared for. I think, though, John, um, talking about tall ships, uh, it, as this flotilla of ships go up the Hudson. Uh, I suspect that our minds would go back a little bit to the tremendous number of, of British ships that were in the harbor uh, in 1776. Uh, warships? Warships. Uh, the um, uh, Admiral Lord Howe was the uh, British Admiral in charge of the British Navy in these parts. And together with his brother, General Howe, uh, who commanded the land forces, Admiral Howe brought over a tremendous contingent of the British Navy. They came over um, not only to um, uh, be here to attack seacoast towns, but uh, they were convoys too, and there was a tremendous um, number of uh, of troop ships that came across. This is basically what he did, wasn't it? He ferried the troops out sure. of Boston and into New York and... Well, and uh, Admiral Howe didn't do that. Admiral Howe was in England, in, in, in English waters. But after General Howe went out of Boston and he went to Halifax and then came down to the, to the Hudson, uh, he was met there by his brother and this was all prearranged and his brother was going to come over with the, with the British fleet. And I understand that there was more than a thousand sail uh, in New York Harbor at that time, mostly between Brooklyn Heights and Staten Island. As a matter of fact, the, there's an old story that if you wanted to put a gangplank from ship to ship to ship to ship, you could walk from Brooklyn Heights or from Brooklyn uh, to Staten Island without getting your feet wet. That's how many ships were there. And it looks like uh, that's the way it's going to be, uh, the way it is this weekend in the Hudson. Uh, basically, though, there were no classic battles, fleet against fleet? There's, there were there are some engagements took place. Uh, there was an engagement uh, just off uh, Newport. But the um, 
great engagement of the war was, of course, the encounter between the French fleet, which had come up from the West Indies, and the British fleet uh, going south from uh, uh, New York uh, to uh, uh, pick up uh, uh, General Cornwallis, who had been trapped, you see, on the Yorktown Peninsula. And on the way down, uh, my, my guess is that the French just happened to be there at the time. Uh, they certainly didn't expect that they were going to meet a, a British fleet coming down. And the British fleet was late in leaving New York, and there they confronted each other. And for one of the rare times, as far as I know, in history, uh, a French fleet defeated a British fleet. In those days when the, when the tall ships fought, in World War II, when, when battleships or cruisers went at each other, usually one ship would end up under the water when it was all over. Did these ships fight to sink other ships or fight to capture them? How did they do that? They certainly did uh, fight to, to sink them if they could. Um, they even got so close together that they used grappling irons uh, to link the two ships together, and one would have to go down. Um, that's how they used to board them. As a matter of fact, I've seen so many pictures, and you probably have too, John, of naval engagements in the, in the Revolution uh, with such uh, ships as old Ironsides, for example, uh, with their, their sails practically in tatters, uh, fire burning all along the, the deck, and yet they were, they were holding together to, to have that last shot at each other. And, you know, they had to lower their colors, and this is the last thing that any commander wanted to do. And he would only do it when he knew that he was at the end of his rope. And it was a rough life for those uh, people who had to staff those ships, wasn't it? Well, it was, I think, the casualties on board the, the British warships, or any warship of, of the time, must have been tremendous, because these men were, were firing the cannon at the portholes, you see, and, and, and this is what the other side were aiming at, too. And time after time, I, I suppose the entire uh, gun crews would be, would be shot to pieces. It must have been a, a, a terrible experience to, go, to have gone through a really a bad engagement, uh, as I say, with ships so close together that they could, uh, they could shout at each other on board the ships. Thank you very much, Dr. Luke.
And that's how it looked during the weekend of Operation Sale, a spectacle which perhaps will not be duplicated for another 100 years. But one thing is certain, America certainly knows how to throw itself a birthday party. For Long Island World, I'm John Miller. Good night.